Have you ever thought about how Byzantine art looks so divine, so ghostly? How its abstract style makes it somehow look more holy and transcendent? Art historian Ernst Kitzinger had a theory as to why this was in his great work, Byzantine Art in the Making. I'm going to read a quote from it. About 20 years ago, I put forward the suggestion that there is an inner connection between striving after abstraction, which, steadily on the rise since the mid-sixth century, reaches a peak in these works of the mid-seventh. The very style of these images may have to do with their increasingly central role in Christian worship, the iconoclastic controversy which ensued in the 8th and 9th centuries produced a large amount of literature on the subject of holy images. A key element in the defense of holy images as it evolved in the 7th century and more systematically during the iconoclasm was the idea that the image stood in a transcendental relationship to the person it represented. No longer was it merely an educational tool, a means of instruction for the illiterate or edification for the simple-minded, as earlier writers had claimed. It was a reflection of its prototype, a link with the invisible and supernatural, a vehicle for transmission for divine forces. Are not the thinness and transparency of the images, in keeping with their being conceived as receptacles for the Holy Ghost and as channels of communication with the deity? Kitzinger goes on to reference a classic essay called Meditations on a Hobby Horse by the famous art historian E. H. Gombrich. In this essay, Gombrich explains that when a child plays with his hobby horse, a toy horse, which may not even look at all like a horse but just be a stick with a makeshift head on it, to him it actually feels like it's alive. Why do kids play with objects as if they're truly living creatures, when the thing itself doesn't even need to look realistic at all for the child to connect deeply with it? Why do kids sometimes prefer a stick or a spoon, and see it as a doll or a dog, instead of a more realistic portrayal? This is the question we're here to answer today, and it ties directly back to Byzantine art and its simplified linearity. There is another way of seeing art which is more psychological, more about direct automatic response. The idea that the simplicity of the forms recalls something primal in the human psyche, which make us sense that that person is real and not merely an artistic image, but at the same time, by not being fully realistic or lifelike, it retains an unconscious primal and uncanny power, because the form is not totally consciously realized. So we stay in that biological mode and engage in a primal sense with these noetic images and forms. Hence their ghostliness, archaism, and spiritual power. Writers on art and aesthetics often use the word image to describe a representation of someone or something. Gombrich says this about those writers, quote, the implication of its definition of an image is that the artist imitates the external form of the object in front of him, and the beholder, in his turn, recognizes the subject of the work of art by this form. Its corollary is that a work of art will either be a faithful copy, in fact a complete replica of the object represented, or will involve some degree of abstraction. So essentially, there's no reason to not strive to be as realistic as possible, so the subject can best be recognized as closer to nature, and that to make it less close is essentially reversing the process on purpose and having the intellectual mind catch up, when really the opposite is likely actually the case, which is Gombrich's thesis here. Talking about the creation of the form of the hobby horse, for example, Gombrich writes, They defined image as imitation of an object's external form, and the external form of a horse is surely not imitated here. The external form, that elusive remnant of the Greek philosophical tradition, which has dominated our aesthetic language for so long. The artist, we read, abstracts the form from the object he sees. One hears it said that the draftsman's line is a tremendous feat of abstraction because it does not occur in nature. Yet, we need only look at our hobby horse to see that the very idea of abstraction as a complicated mental act lands us in curious absurdities. There's an old music hall joke describing a drunkard who politely lifts his hat to every lamppost he passes. 
Should we say that the liquor has so increased his power of abstraction that he is now able to isolate the formal quality of uprightness from both lamppost and the human figure? Our mind, of course, works by differentiation rather than by generalization. So what Gombrich is saying is that it would be ridiculous to say that our mind works by simplifying forms to their essentials as an intellectual process. It's more of a biological instinctual recall. It isn't done with the totality of our contemplative eyes and brains. Therefore, this is why abstraction is a primitive phenomenon and not a higher intellectual one by default. Intellectuals can simply think their way back into abstraction. There's a debate in art history about the term stylized, a word which implies that anything not true to nature is done on purpose, when really it's basically the opposite. Byzantine forms, primitive forms, are not stylized on purpose. They're more true to the noetic understanding, which I'll explain in a future video. Now, back to the word stylized. Gombrich says, Recently we have been made aware of how thoroughly we misunderstand primitive or Egyptian art whenever we make the assumption that the artist distorts his motif or that he even wants us to see in his work the record of any specific experience. In many cases, these images represent, in the sense of being substitutes, the clay horse or servant buried in the tomb of the mighty takes the place of the living. The idol takes the place of the god. The question whether it represents the external form of the particular divinity, or for that matter, of a class of demons, is quite inappropriate. The idol serves as the substitute of the god in worship and ritual. It is a man-made god, in precisely the sense that the hobby horse is a man-made horse. To question it further means to court deception. Let me explain this bit about the common factor being biological function, using Gombrich's words. So that goes back to primitive worship as being a natural worship of some sort of what looks like a deity. Gombrich writes, the first hobby horse, to use 18th century language, was probably no image at all, just a stick which qualified as a horse because one could ride on it. The common factor was function rather than form. Any rideable object could serve as a horse. If that is true, we may be enabled to cross a boundary which is usually regarded as closed and sealed, for in this sense substitutes reach deep into biological functions that are common to man and animal. The cat runs after the ball as if it were a mouse. The baby sucks its thumb as if it were the breast. In a sense, the ball represents a mouse to the cat, the thumb a breast to the baby. But here too, representation does not depend on formal similarities, meaning if it looks similar in its general form, beyond the minimum requirements of function. The ball has nothing in common with the mouse except that it is chaseable. As substitutes, they fulfill certain demands of the organism. They are keys which happen to fit into biological or psychological locks. In the language of the nursery, the psychological function of representation is still recognized. The child will reject a perfectly naturalistic doll in favor of some monstrously abstract dummy, which is cuddly. It may even dispose of the element of form altogether and take to a blanket as its favorite comforter a substitute on which to bestow its love. He then explains how later in life he may bestow this love on a living substitute. Figures in our lives take the place of fundamental familial representatives, coming from our biological needs. A teacher, for example, may take the place of the mother. Once more, the common denominator between the symbol and the thing symbolized is not the external form, but the function. He writes, the witch who has made a generalized wax dummy of an enemy may have meant it to refer to someone in particular. She would then pronounce the right spell to establish this link, much as we may write a caption under a generalized picture to do the same. The uncanniness is accounted for here. So essentially, we take the important signs and signals of someone's form for biological recall then, on a primal level, we assign a magical quality to that person. We're not going about this through an intellectual process of precise and rigorous generalization. We're not thinking purely aesthetically, seeing form alone and the ways that forms can be twisted and generalized. We're thinking for our survival, 
We're building up a picture that looks similar enough to recall it to our minds, to feel like we're facing a person, which creates the religious reverence to them. Let's continue to another idea, which is that primitive art making is not really meant for an audience, and is not necessarily about communicating an idea. That comes at a much later, more advanced cultural stage, contrary to popular opinion on art and aesthetics. A new video will be released on this subject, on the evolution of our current idea of art through human history. Gombrich writes that the owner of a hobby horse, we can suppose, might have wanted to give his horse some real reins and maybe two eyes. Some grass could pass for a mane. Thus, he now had a horse. An important fact here is to understand that, in this entire process, communication doesn't necessarily enter into it at all. He may not have wanted to show his horse to anyone. It just served as a focus for his fantasies as he galloped along. Though more likely than not, it fulfilled the same function for a tribe, to which it represented some horse demon of fertility and power. Thus, Gombrich says that substitution may precede portrayal, and creation may precede communication. He goes on to hypothesize about the invention of language, that maybe instead of the theory that sees the root of language in imitation, and another which sees it in emotive interjection, were to be joined by another, imagining the primitive hunter lying awake through hungry winter nights and making the sound of eating, not for communication but as a substitute for eating, being joined perhaps by a ritualistic chorus trying to conjure up the phantasm of food, thus the same principle. Now let me explain how the biological mechanism works. This part relates strongly back to Byzantine art once again. In Byzantine art, our primordial image of the Mother Mary comes to the fore in a more biologically striking way. The gold background also increases this noetic potential, pure abstract image space, for these figures to appear onto. Gombrich writes, Pliny, and innumerable writers after him, have regarded it as the greatest triumph of naturalistic art for a painter to have deceived sparrows or horses. The implication of these anecdotes is that a human beholder easily recognizes a bunch of grapes in a painting, because for him, recognition is an intellectual act. But for the birds to fly at the painting is a sign of a complete objective illusion. It is a plausible idea, but a wrong one. The merest outline of a cow seems sufficient for a tsetse trap, for somehow it sees the apparatus of attraction in motion and deceives the fly. To the fly, we might say, the crude trap has the significant form, biologically significant, that is. It appears that visual stimuli of this kind play an important part in the animal world. By varying the shapes of dummies to which animals were seen to respond, the minimum image that still suffice to release a specific reaction has been ascertained. Thus, little birds will open their beak when they see the feeding parent approaching the nest, but they will also do so when they are shown two darkish roundels of different size, the silhouette of the head and body of the bird represented in its most generalized form. Certain young fishes can even be deceived by two simple dots arranged horizontally, which they take to be the eyes of the mother fish, in whose mouth they are accustomed to shelter against danger. The fame of Zeuxis will have to rest on other achievements than his deception of birds. An image, in this biological sense, is not an imitation of an object's external form, but an imitation of certain privileged or relevant aspects. It is here that a wide field of investigation would seem to be open, for man is not exempt from this type of reaction. The artist who goes out to represent the visible world is not simply faced with a neutral medley of forms he seeks to imitate. Ours is a structured universe whose main lines of force are still bent and fashioned by our biological and psychological needs, however much they may be overlaid by cultural influences. We know that there are certain privileged motifs in our world to which we respond almost too easily. The human face may be outstanding among them. Whether by instinct or by very early training, we are certainly ever disposed to single out the expressive features of a face from the chaos of sensations that surrounds it, and to respond to its slightest variations with fear or joy, 
Our whole perceptual apparatus is somehow hypersensitized in this direction of physiognomic vision, and the merest hint suffices for us to create an expressive physiognomy that looks at us with a surprising intensity. In a heightened state of emotion, in the dark, or in a feverish spell, the looseness of this trigger may assume pathological forms. We may see faces in the pattern of a wallpaper, and three apples arranged on a plate may stare at us like two eyes and a clownish nose. What wonder that it is so easy to make a face with two dots and a stroke, even though their geometrical constellation may be greatly at variance with the external form of a real head. Gombrich says, It still needs no great effort of the imagination to understand how the horse could become such a focus of desires and aspirations. For our language still carries the metaphors molded by a feudal past, when to be chivalrous was to be horsey. The same stick that had to represent a horse in such a setting would have become the substitute of something else in another. It might have become a sword, a scepter, or, in the context of ancestor worship, a fetish representing a dead chieftain. Seen from the point of view of abstraction, such a convergence of meanings onto one shape offers considerable difficulties. But from that of psychological projection of meanings, it becomes much more easily intelligible. For while the idea of realistic pictures being deliberately stylized seems hard to swallow, the opposite idea of a limited vocabulary of simple shapes being used for the building up of different representations would fit much better into what we know of primitive art. He then explains his definition of the famous term in art, the conceptual image. He writes, By this we mean the mode of representation which is more or less common to children's drawings and to various forms of primitive and primitivist art. The remoteness of this type of imagery from any visual experience has often been described. Gombrich explains that it cannot just be a substitute with no similarity, it needs what he calls the minimum image. At the most primitive level, then, the conceptual image might be identified with what we have called the minimum image, that minimum, that is, which will make it fit into a psychological lock. It is a mistake, though, to think that the conceptual image in historical art styles is the minimum image. It isn't this clear-cut. Gombrich writes, One has the impression that the presence of these schemata is always felt, but that they are as much avoided as exploited. We must reckon with the possibility of a style being a set of conventions born out of complex tensions. The man-made image must be complete. Image-making is beset with dangers. One false stroke and the rigid mask of the face may assume an evil leer. Strict adherence to conventions alone can guard against such dangers, like in Byzantine and Egyptian, its forebear, art. And thus, primitive art seems often to keep on that narrow ledge that lies between the lifeless and the uncanny. If the hobby horse became too lifelike, it might gallop away on its own, 